On January 21st of 1998, in Escondido, California, horror spread through the Crow household. What was supposed to be just any regular day was interrupted in the worst way possible. The family awoke to find the brutally murdered body of 12-year-old Stephanie. The killers left no traces, no weapons, no motives. In the following days, police zeroed in on Stephanie's 14-year-old brother and his two friends, believing wholeheartedly that they had found the perpetrators. But what followed was a twisted tale of false confessions, police misconduct, and potentially a cover-up. Today, we'll be attempting to unravel the web of uncertainty and deception in a case that left a community in terror. Stephanie Ann Crow was born on April 12, 1985. Known endearingly to her family as Steffi, she was radiant and positive. At the time of her death, she was a seventh grader in the local middle school, Hidden Valley. Stephanie was passionate and knew exactly what she wanted in life at such a young age. Her main goal was to become a teacher. To her, making a difference to the lives of others was exactly up her alley, and she was dedicated to making her dreams a reality. Overall, it stated that she was an incredibly caring person. In 1997, she was awarded a Philanthropy Award, a testament to her compassion and desire to love and provide for those around her. She was named Volunteer of the Year by the Escondido Library Endowment Foundation. But Stephanie kept busy in other ways too. She was an avid Girl Scout and president of the choir club in her school. Not a day went by that she wasn't up to something. I read a lot in my research about just a few of the things that really went to show what a genuinely loving individual she was. Her mother recalls a day in which she noticed a disabled child alone after school waiting for the bus. It didn't seem like anyone around him had noticed and he was sitting by himself. So Stephanie took it upon herself to be the only one to go over to him and talk to him, see if he needed any assistance and generally just offer a helping hand. She was a very popular girl too, who seemed to just have a natural talent for making friends. In the first grade, a young Iranian girl joined her classroom. This girl had very limited English abilities and found it quite difficult to fit in. Naturally, Stephanie took the girl under her wing to help her navigate this new environment. She would skip her recess period to come inside and rush into the second grade classroom to help the younger kids with their learning. But she had a lot of things that she really enjoyed outside of school too. Her favourite film was The Titanic, a staple that she'd watched many times over including, unfortunately, the day before her tragic end. She loved to celebrate holidays with her family and would always try to find an excuse to create cards for them. This next part that I read about was just, like, really adorable, in my opinion. She would take these homemade cards and on the back, where the brand is normally stamped when you have a store-bought card, she would write Steph Mart as if it was her own little brand to show her family her love. She was creative and energetic. She loved to sew and cross stitch and really enjoyed getting involved in any artsy ordeal. That was quite a bit of background information, but I do think that it's important to look at the type of person that Stephanie was and really establish just how much of a pillar she was to those around her at such a young age. She was headstrong, confident, and knew just what she wanted from life. On the 20th of February, 1998, the Crow family went to bed just as they typically did. Stephanie had been re-watching Titanic and was likely preparing for her day at school the next day. Between the hours of 10 and 11 p.m., the lives of the family would be changed forever. Stephanie, laying in her bed, was stabbed nine times on her head and her torso with a five to six inch blade. Her body was dumped on her bedroom floor, laying in a pool of blood and the killer seemingly fled, leaving no signs or trace. In the early morning of the next day, the 21st, at 6.30am, her alarm clock began to blare. This was her signal that it was time to arise and get ready for school, but the alarm just kept on going. It hadn't been shut off. Confused at this, Stephanie's grandmother, Judith, entered her room to attempt to wake her. Instead, she came face to face with her granddaughter's lifeless body. The victim was found by her grandmother after the grandmother was awakened by the alarm clock in the victim's bedroom. When Judith Kennedy found her granddaughter lying on the bedroom floor, she yelled, awakening Stephanie's parents. Then, her dad called for help. My daughter! What's the problem? She's right on the floor, she's not breathing. There's blood all over the place, please! Oh my God, I'm My daughter's dead! 
police were immediately called to the scene, and they quickly began to notice some things around the room. Firstly, it was apparent that two things had taken place. Stephanie had attempted to escape her attacker, as shown by the defensive wounds and stab wounds on both sides of her body. Secondly, the stabbing hadn't actually been the thing that had ended her life. Blood evidence across the floor showed that she'd survived the stabbing and had tried to crawl out of her room, presumably to get help, but she only managed to make it to her doorway before passing away due to blood loss. There were some quite odd things about the crime scene too. For example, it didn't seem as though there'd been any forced entry. Her bedroom window was unlocked, though it wasn't open nor broken, and there was also no disturbance on the dust or insect traces that had formed on the window, so it seemed unlikely that somebody had managed to enter through there. The parents' sliding glass door was also unlocked, but they were covered by heavy aluminium blinds that would have caused a loud disturbance if someone had broken in. Years later, it was found that the family often kept the door to the laundry room unlocked too, which led directly to the outside. There was also just generally no evidence to go off at the crime scene. Given that a break-in seemed quite unlikely, the police surmised that this had been an inside job. There was no evidence that anyone from the outside had entered, so that seemed like the only logical explanation. Either somebody within the house, or with easy access to the house that knew the family, had to have committed this murder. And without any hesitation, it seems, they were already ready to point fingers. Now, I couldn't find too much information about Michael Crow, who is Stephanie's older brother. At the time of her death, he was 14, two years older than her. From everything that I could read, they had a generally fairly good relationship. They seemed to argue about as much as any siblings do, but it didn't seem anything that was distressing or concerning. But to police, it simply wasn't good enough. In their eyes, Michael may have been the one that murdered his sister based on a few factors. The first being that when police arrived at the home, they noted that Michael was quite distant and preoccupied. He didn't seem too overly bothered or emotional about the situation. The secondary reason was that they found a hair on Stephanie's body, which I think this is quite stupid, but apparently it perfectly matched Michael. As far as I can tell in my research though, they didn't actually DNA test this hair. They essentially looked at it and said that it looked like it could be his. I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a minute here. Even if it was his hair, 100% confirmed, he lives in the same home as her. It's not particularly unfathomable to me that they could have just ended up with that hair being on her from general walking around the home and using items but I don't know for certain. Naturally, as we expected, whenever a situation like this happens, they interviewed all members of the household. But the pressure that they put on Michael in particular and the tactics that they used on this young boy was such a disgusting miscarriage of justice and pointed the entire investigation in the wrong direction. I'm kind of thinking, you know, why I'm, I'm speaking to you. I guess. Michael and their younger sister Shannon were both removed from their parents for the time being. Shannon was nine, for the record. They were questioned separately and away from their parents, without any lawyers or adults present. Shannon's testimony isn't too important for this case, but Michael's is everything. Do you have any idea who may have wanted to harm your sister? No. If you had anything to do with it, would you tell me? Yes. According to Michael, in the early hours of the morning, he had turned on his television to use it as a light. He'd been suffering with the flu for the past few days, and so he'd woken up with quite a headache. He figured he would go downstairs and get some Tylenol to try and help. He stated that he passed Stephanie's room at about 4.30am, and he noted that it was quite odd that her door was shut because it was so early in the morning, but he dismissed this and went to the kitchen to get some medicine and went straight back to his room. But there was a bit of an inconsistency in this story which raised red flags with police. See, Stephanie's body was found in her doorway. The door was open. And it was concrete fact that she had died between 10 and 11 p.m. Assuming that Michael was being truthful, who had opened the door hours after her passing? Law enforcement were very quick to pounce on this weakness. In this same interview, Michael spoke of two of his friends. Joshua Treadway and Aaron Hauser, 
both aged 15. Both boys were also questioned with similarly vicious intent. Police learned that Aaron actually collected knives. His parents had reported one of these knives as being missing and it was found in Joshua's room. It was a little bit smaller than the knife they assumed to be used on Stephanie. They said that the knife used on Stephanie was five to six inches. This missing knife was a four to five. Regardless, the knife was found in Joshua's home. The boys were all treated like criminals from day one. There would be no reason for your hair to be in Stephanie's room after she was found with her. After 14 minutes of questioning Michael, Detective Clater leaves the room and his suspect alone. The questions were leading and demanding and the interviews all took place with no adults present. Michael definitely got the hardest of it though. Their theory on this second day of the investigation is that a very smart, very lonely and very angry Michael Crow stabbed his sister to death. His likely motive, a rage-fueled case of sibling rivalry. I'm looking at you right now, okay, and inside you're about ready to burst. We can't bring her back. She's gone. Okay? You're fighting it. You're, you're, you're... I don't know what to do anymore. I understand. You know, I'm being told that I'm lying. I'm, I'm not, not saying... Lying. Michael, I'm not saying that. Have you heard me say that? What if they come back and say to you, Michael... We have your hair. For 27 hours, he was blamed for the death of his little sister. The police berated him, threw accusations, and arguably worst of all, completely lied to him. It is legal for police to lie to suspects during interrogation, though it's very immoral in my opinion. But that's exactly what they did. They told Michael that they knew he had killed his sister that they'd found undeniable blood evidence within his room. An investigator with 23 years of experience returns with his tough, less patient style and more false evidence. You know there was a lot of blood. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. You need to stay with me, Michael. It's very difficult for the person who did it not to, not to, to get blood on him. Yeah. Okay? and not to transfer that blood to other parts of the house. Yeah. We found blood in your room already. God, where'd you find it? Pardon me? Where'd you find the blood? I, I'm sure you, you know. What? God, I don't, I, no, I don't know. I didn't do it. I swear to that. Does that mean you can't tell me about the knife? I don't know what are talking about. Okay. I, you're 14? Yes. You got your whole life ahead of you, don't you? Yeah. They told him that his family all knew he was a killer and hated him. They told him all about the horrors of adult prison and told him that if he didn't confess, he'd be sent there. Even when he was doing exactly as they wanted, they still pushed him further. They asked him to take a lie detector test, which he did happily. But when he agreed to it, they immediately began to quiz him about why he was so willing and eager to do one, especially if he was so clearly guilty. His response, in my opinion, was really, really harrowing. This is a direct quote from him. I feel like I just... I spent all day away from my family. I couldn't see them. I feel like I'm being treated like I killed my sister and I didn't. It feels horrible, like I'm being blamed for it. Everything I own is gone. Everything I have is gone. Everything. You won't even let me see my parents. It's horrible. Question after question was thrown his way, and Michael was clearly breaking. God. Oh, God. God. Why? You tell me. Why are you doing this to me? If I did this, I don't remember it. I don't okay. remember the thing. I... And you know what? That's possible. <laughs> Interrogators essentially made him believe that he had committed this murder and had blanked it out and completely forgotten. Finally, he was given a break. And when the investigators left, he was heard to have said this. God, God, why, why, why? 
Oh God, God, why, why? I don't deserve life. I don't want to live. I can't believe it. Oh God, God, why, why? How could I have done this? I don't even remember if I did it. Police made Michael write an apology to his sister, which was later brought up as evidence that he had committed this crime. Dear Stephanie, they are putting me through hell, and I think that's what I deserve. If I did do this, then I am insane. The only way I know I did is because they told me I did. I want you to know that I was not myself when I did this. Simultaneously, Aaron and Joshua, his two friends, were also being questioned for hours. And eventually, Joshua couldn't take it anymore. He began to confess, which started a spiral that caused finger pointing and blaming to begin. The investigators told Joshua that Michael had confessed to the murder already and was implicating him. I have this overwhelming feeling that I killed her, but... Okay, let's, let's hear... Let me hear about it. I don't know why I feel that way. Let me hear about it. It will... I'll, I'll lie. I'll have to make it out. Let's destroy Michael. That night... <laughs> I don't matter. They told him that Michael was planning to set him up to take the fall for the entire thing. Of course, Joshua was desperate. He knew he didn't do it. So he forged a story that would make him seem less guilty. According to Joshua, Michael had been talking for a long time about how much he disliked Stephanie. He was always complaining about her and openly discussed his desire to see her dead. He had thought that Michael was joking until that night. The pair went over to Aaron's house to get a knife. Michael then went into his sister's room and brutally stabbed her, while Joshua acted as a lookout. Joshua went very, very in-depth with this confession. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a transcript of what exactly he said, but sources all state that it was riddled with inconsistencies. Lots of things that he said just didn't align with the facts that were known, but the police ignored it all because a confession was a confession. Interestingly, neither boy actually implemented Aaron in their confession, but when Aaron was questioned, he was asked how he hypothetically would have killed Stephanie had he been involved. For example, he was asked, if you went into her room and saw her, how would you approach it? To which he answered, well, at this time, she would probably be sleeping. If she was sleeping, I probably would just try to cut her throat as quickly as possible without really waking her. They then asked, how would you do that? He replied, if she was sleeping on her back, I would, with my left hand, cover her mouth and simultaneously slice her throat and hold it a while until I was sure that she was dead. Because of the two confessions from Joshua and Michael and this hypothetical situation that Aaron proposed, all three of the boys were arrested under suspicion of murder and they were being prepared to be tried as adults. Eventually, the hearing came up for the boys, however, hours of statements had to be tossed. Of the over 35 hours of combined interview time, they could only use two hours of Joshua's confessions in court. This was because police had actually failed to inform the boys of their rights, and because it was evident that they'd used coercive and manipulative tactics to gain a false statement. Either way, it went on to jury. But as jury selection was about to take place, something happened that flipped the case on its head. Whilst waiting for jury selection, DNA tests located something. There was a sweatshirt, not one in the house, that had Stephanie's blood on it. This clothing actually didn't belong to anyone related to this case at all. 
It didn't belong to anyone in the family, any of the friends. The shirt actually belonged to a homeless drifter, 28-year-old Richard Tewitt. It was even harder to find information about Richard Tewitt. But I can tell you that he was a deeply troubled man. He suffered very badly with schizophrenia. He found it difficult to hold jobs or relationships, and seemed to only really have a relationship with his sister. Overall, he faced many hardships. Here's the interesting part to me. Richard Tewitt was actually questioned the day after Stephanie's murder. He had been in the local area that day and the day before, and he had been reported to police a lot by the Crow family's neighbours. Tewitt had been acting really erratically on the night of the 20th, and had been causing quite a disturbance. He had been found to be peeking into people's windows, apparently looking for something, or someone. One neighbour reported hearing Tewitt yell, I'm going to kill you, you fucking bitch. But it didn't seem like he was talking to anybody specific. And another witnessed him wandering around aimlessly in circles. Between 7 and 8pm, Tuit knocked on the door of a woman, who opened it believing it to be one of her neighbours. He entered her house. While standing there, Tuit continually asked her where Tracy was, to which, of course, the woman could not reply. She didn't know what he was talking about or who Tracy was. Eventually, Tuit decided to leave, though asked for Tracy one last time before leaving. He was reported to the police for this interaction, as well as the looking into multiple other people's windows. Police arrived to assess the situation, and an officer sat outside in his car, very close to the Crow residence. He stated that he saw the Crow residence door closing, but he didn't look further into it. There wasn't any reason for suspicion. This is all undeniable facts, the rest is a little bit more hazy. Most of this is speculative or assumptions based on Tuit's trial later on. Essentially, it was assumed that Richard Tuit was the person who closed the door to the laundry room. He had been in the area at the time and had also been reported to police multiple times due to his interactions with other people's homes and doors. Witnesses stated that he appeared drunk or high, but I personally think it's a bit more likely that he was going through a psychotic episode. Based on his behaviour, it was stated that he was seen to be the most likely person to have committed this crime. On the night after the murder, Tuit was questioned. His clothes were taken, but there was no evidence found on them. Now, this is where things honestly get even more interesting. The defence attorney of Joshua Treadway sent Tuit's clothes to a criminologist. This criminologist determined that there was blood belonging to Stephanie on it but police had tested these clothes on the night and didn't find anything. It could have been that the police were incompetent, or it could have been that the blood wasn't there at the time. This whole situation started a spat between the defence team of the boys and the defence team of Tuit. Tuit's defence argued that the boys had indeed killed Stephanie, and that the DNA evidence on Tuit's clothes was merely a result of contamination due to shoddy police work. This whole back and forth has caused a lot of people to raise their eyebrows and question who exactly is it that's wrong. Tuit was acquitted of murder and was instead given a sentence of voluntary manslaughter, likely on account of his severe mental illness. On May 26, 2004, he was given 17 years behind bars. The boys were all completely cleared of any wrongdoing. All three families sued the city and were given settlements, with the ruling being made they were factually innocent of all charges. The case was permanently dismissed towards them. Now, typically you might expect a story to end here. The murderer was found and sentenced, the innocents were let free and given compensation, police were lambasted for their work, and it sounds like as positive an outcome you can get. But unfortunately, that's not quite the case. Tuit actually ended up appealing his conviction to the California Court of Appeals under several claims. This included a violation of his Sixth Amendment. He stated that his defence had not been allowed to properly cross-examine a prosecution witness. On September 8th, 2011, a panel of judges voted 2-1 in favour of overturning his manslaughter conviction 
based on several different factors. The original judge limiting cross-examination, the lack of actual evidence tying him to the crime, their exact statement was the following. Given the lack of evidence tying to it to the crime, the problems with the DNA evidence, the jury's deadlock and compromise verdict, and the weight and strategic position of McCrary's testimony, this case is one of those unusual circumstances in which we find ourselves in virtual equipoise as the harmlessness of error. We must treat the error as affecting the verdict, and we are compelled to grant this. It was noted in the appeal that the prosecution didn't actually provide any evidence at all that Tuit had ever entered the house. None of his DNA was present in the home, and it was all quite circumstantial. They couldn't actually prove that he had been there. Therefore, Tuit was granted a retrial on October 24th, 2013. His attorney stated in a matter-of-fact way that Tuit had never been in the Crow house before this date. Therefore, how would he be able to find Stephanie's room without alerting others to his presence? There were six people in the home. It sounds quite unreasonable. None of his fingerprints or DNA were ever found in the house. They also brought an expert who came in to testify that the blood on the shirt had not been there during their initial evaluation and they had indeed been soiled due to contamination. Prosecution stated that Tuit had been wandering the streets that night. He was obsessive and delusional, angry at a woman named Tracy who had rejected him in the past. He supposedly then wandered into the Crow home. But the problem is, prosecution was unable to give an actual timeline of what they believed transpired. Instead, they simply stated he had entered the home, stabbed Stephanie, and left. They didn't offer any further detail. On December 5th, 2013, the jury came back with their verdict. Not guilty. A juror stated they'd reached this verdict as there was no evidence that Tuit was ever actually in the residence. There was a very real possibility that the blood came via contamination. They could not, therefore, in good faith convict him. He was released and his sentence overturned. Arguably, that's a very sombre note to end on. Since then, there's been no further information about this case. No more convictions, no new suspects. This case has given rise to many different theories. Some believe that police actually did see the blood on Tuit's shirt, but chose to overlook it and cover this information up in order to prosecute the teens so they could justify their awful treatment. Others believe that the police were just incredibly lax and the blood evidence truly did come from their incompetence. Regardless, in the eyes of the law, Tuit is an innocent man, leaving the mystery of who exactly killed Stephanie Crow unsolved to this day. If you somehow stumbled across this video and watched, um, thank you. Um, I really love true crime, if you can't tell. Um, I've been obsessed with true crime for years. Um, so it's very fun to be making these kind of videos. I have tried it in the past and I just wasn't particularly good at it, but I'm feeling really motivated. I just want to do this for myself more than anything um, and just kind of see how things go. Uh, so, you know, if you want to stick around and see any more cases and videos that I record, then please do. It would be nice to have you along. Um, but yeah, thank you so much.